you know you're not going to be able to go back to China after this goes public, right? Yeah, I'm all over. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, man, that's wild. So at the time, this was pretty deep into the COVID quarantine. Well, not deep. This was like February. So about a month in, give or take. About a month in. At the time, the quarantine policy was pretty much you couldn't leave your apartment without special permission. You need to get permission from the local government to leave. And it wasn't exactly treated as like an optional thing. So I was following all the rules. I did everything I could. I'm sitting in my apartment. I had just gone to bed about two hours prior. And then all of a sudden I hear like this loud banging on my door, like almost as loud as it can get. So I wake up, of course, because I'm like, who's banging on my door? And I go to open it and I creak the door open a little bit because I didn't want to use the eye hole for some reason. I creak open the door a little bit and I just see a shiny police badge. And my first thought is, oh, oh, because I have no idea why they're visiting. So I open the door and he barges in and he demands to see my passport because foreigner. I get my passport for him and I show it to him and he looks it over. And for like the longest three minutes of my life, I'm sitting there watching him look at my passport. Like I'm thinking there's something wrong from how long he's looking. And he hands it back to me and he says something along the lines of your passport looks like it's about to expire. Thankfully, it wasn't. It wouldn't expire till July because we had to get our residence permit. So the way residency works is you get your Z visa to get there, and then you have to get a separate permit to stay there called a residence permit. And you have to renew that every six months, six or five months. It's kind of fuzzy because I got there in August. They didn't want me to renew till July, but that's besides the point. So yeah, it turns out the reason they're going door to door was because there were a couple of foreigners in the building who weren't there legally. So they were just pounding on any door that had a foreigner in it looking for someone who wasn't legally there. And this is the height of COVID, which is the worst time possible to be, you know, not there legally. Yeah, you don't want to be a bad guy on China's land while they can't get you to leave. Yeah, it's it was bad. And not to mention there were these, I don't know if anyone had told you this, but there were like these vaccination camps outside the city. So a lot of the time, if you violated the law, you didn't go to jail. They took you to one of these vaccination camps which were, for lack of a better word, they were kind of just work camps that they set up under the guise of treating people. Wow. Well, when you hear vaccination camp in China, you don't really think treatment. That's wild. So they used vaccines as an excuse to just like... It was, yeah, it was an excuse to trap dissidents. Wow, that is fucked. So they had these camps set up for quarantine. They called them vaccination camps, quarantine camps, use whatever word you'd like. The fact that they called them camps doesn't really help. Yeah, no, that's that's never a good sign. When you hear like dictatorship plus camps, you're like, eh, nah. It, it doesn't usually end well. No. But the, the name doesn't matter so much as the camp part. That's the consistent part is that it was a camp. Yeah. And you didn't want to be there. So how much do you know about how Alipay worked? Alipay is the app that they basically use for all of their transactions along with WeChat, right? Correct. So on your phone, you had to like take a health test and they give you a green, yellow, or red stamp to scan. So every time you had to go somewhere, you had to show this QR code. And what that was, was like a microcosm of your health record. They would just scan and know everything you had done health-wise. This was big after COVID. This wasn't a thing till COVID became a thing. And they just used it as an excuse to keep doing it afterward? Pretty much, yeah. It was introduced during COVID, and I still talk to people back there that it's still a thing. You still have to show that QR code every time you want to get on the subway or get on a bus anytime. You have to show it. Wow. And if it's anything but green, you can be denied service. I mean, it makes sense, but also like everyone just has that shit on their phone at all times that's a little spooky yeah it's it's also strange because they can track you through alipay oh yeah obviously they're working with the government yeah and the health code doesn't help much either like giving that much power to a company is never a good sign i mean here in america we like to choose what companies we let ourselves be data slaves to exactly you don't get that choice in china whatsoever so that QR code, it could be green, yellow, or red. If it was green, you were considered healthy. You were allowed to interact with other people. Yellow, you had to quarantine for two weeks. Red, they recommended you visit a hospital where they would recommend you to one of those vaccination camps. That is fucking wild. You know you're not going to be able to go back to China after this goes public, right? Yeah, I'm all over. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, man, that's wild. So it, it was literally set up in such a way that 
you had to get this QR code. And like I said, you had to get permission to leave your apartment during the early days. This was before they got the QR code thing set up. So in the early days, each apartment had three people that could leave at a time. You couldn't leave unless you got special permission. And that permission lasted for, I, if I want to say three hours, you could only be out of the apartment for three hours. Enough time to do grocery shopping or something important. So if you ran out of time, you were SOL. And what happens if they catch you out there? Most of the time, people would just be taken off the street and sent to jail. Fuck. Like, not even we're going to take you home. It's your... That's wild. Well, the guys was, we want to ensure that the quarantine isn't broken. And then the whole mask thing, that was another big thing. Like, it wasn't as big of a deal there because people were used to wearing masks due to the pollution levels. Because it, it, it's pretty bad. Like, pollution over there is awful air pollution, especially in the mornings. But they really enforce the mask thing. Like, I mean, that one makes sense. Yeah. You wouldn't get in trouble if you didn't have a mask on. They just tell you to pull one up. But it was still a common enough occurrence that I was terrified. So I always wore masks. Yeah. The thing about the way COVID was handled in China is that they did all the stuff America should have done and then did way too much other than that. Like, mask requirements, good. Vaccine requirements, good. Jail and concentration camps? Let's... No. Let's back up a little bit. Hold up. So, a lot of people were wondering how China let COVID get out of hand or let it spread. So, this is what we were told November. We were told that there was an outbreak of pneumonia in Wuhan. We were told that there were a huge rising of cases of pneumonia in Wuhan in November. And then by December, we were told that there, we were likely going to have to quarantine soon. And, well, we all know how that worked out. Yeah. It didn't work out too well. So we quarantine, and it's just free reign for the police at this time because they're free to do pretty much whatever they need to do to ensure the safety of the public, quote, end quote. And to be abundantly clear here, this guy's not anti-mask or anti-vax. I wouldn't have someone like that on my channel. China's just really fucking scary. It really is. Like, the police there, to give you a description of the difference between Chinese police and American police, American police wear regular body armor for their own safety. These guys go almost militaristic with their body armor. All the stuff they wear is about as close to, like, combat veteran stuff. Like, it is a whole nother level of just, you don't want to fuck around and find out. So back to the police visiting me, like I said, they were looking for a foreigner who was there illegally. And by illegally, I mean their visa had just expired and they couldn't get out of the apartment to renew it, which is already in and of itself a bad situation. So they're going through like every foreigner's door. They're just pounding on the doors and going, come on out, show us your passport right now. It's not a we need a warrant. They just search your home. So, yeah, the knocking, that's a formality. They don't have to knock. Honestly, if they want to, they could have just kicked in doors and done what they had wanted. You don't have Fourth Amendment rights in China. It's pretty much they search your place. And if they find something, you're as good as jailed. Yeah. And if you do go to jail, what's the legal system like for, you know, getting out? It is definitely not a fair trial. It, it's very much skewed towards if you're charged with a crime, you're more likely to end up in jail than not. It's not a fair system. You don't really get good representation. It's kind of just you show up, a judge says you're guilty, and you go home. They, I don't even think they do a jury system. And don't even start about the cameras just being everywhere like every corner had a camera yeah because the common argument is americans have cameras all over them too we just use them from our pockets right but there really is a difference between autonomy in choosing the reasoning behind using that camera and going out to get food and not having the ability to do so without your face being tracked by the largest database of people on earth yep and I mean, it's it's unreal. So there, there's ups and downs to it. So the down is that you have zero privacy. The up is you can leave a bike with the keys in the ignition all day and no one will steal it. Wow. Which I've done like I did like six times while I lived there. <laughs> leave it, not steal it. <laughs> like legit, I, I would leave my bike, leave the keys in the ignition and then I'd go to work for eight hours. I'd come back. The bike is still there. Wow. Because you, you can't get away with anything. It's like the Truman Show. Like, literally, it's like the Truman Show. Like, everything's so perfect while you live in this facade. Pretty much. Like, it's, it's terrifying when you think about it. Like, I don't condone the camera usage whatsoever. I'm a very big advocate of privacy and autonomy in that regard. But the level of security is unreal. Like, you cannot imagine it until you've been there. 
and it's it's just terrifying i know i keep repeating that but like there's no better way to describe it yeah there's a reason i never want to go to china no matter what under its current political regime i could have a dying family member there i would not touch that shit. hell no i am amazed that you made it in and out and still have a somewhat positive view of the place because from what you've told me it sounded like an overall positive experience well yeah like the teaching was great the kids were great and the people i interacted with were great it's just that the environment isn't great you kind of have to make it work with your own positivity and that's not even counting the time they shut off my internet for two weeks. Ooh. So for those who don't know about Tiananmen Square, back in the 80s, there were people who protested the Chinese regime in mainland China, in Beijing. And in Beijing, there's a place called Tiananmen Square. They protested there, and the Chinese government shut it down with tanks. This is why Google is banned, by the way, because Google refused to hide the truth. So they have their firewall set up and their listening devices set up because there's listening devices everywhere where if they hear Tiananmen Square mentioned in any context, it doesn't even matter if you're like planning a trip, your internet will be put under surveillance for two weeks and essentially shut off if you don't have a VPN. While they monitor and try to track if you've done something wrong. In my case, my friends and I were talking and we, they made a joke about it. And I was like, guys, seriously, don't. My internet will get shut off. And then five minutes after they said that, I wasn't able to access any internet functionality <laughs> unless I used a VPN. You know what VPN you should use? Trust me on this. You know what VPN you should use? NordVPN, baby! Surprise sponsorship! Thanks, Alejandro. You're the best contact I've ever had in a sponsor segment. So, NordVPN. So when he says VPN, VPNs are actually ridiculously important when you are living in a country with surveillance or censorship to the point where it prevents you from living your everyday life as someone from outside of that country. You can't access a lot of the sites. Like he said, Google or YouTube. You can't access, say, some of the things that you want just to talk to your family. Certain chat apps are banned. Most of them are banned because they're encrypted, and encryption prevents the Chinese government from seeing what you're saying. Because, you know, end-to-end -end encryption, which is something that NordVPN does, actually prevents any government from being able to see what's going through your internet. It's like being in a locked box, and the only other person who has a key is the guy at the end of the tunnel. So... There are a lot of things you don't need a VPN for, but there are some that you really do. Watching content from another country, for instance, is a very powerful one, and censorship and surveillance avoidance. If you are someone who is a dissident of the country you live in, and you don't have a VPN, and that country doesn't like you, you could be screwing yourself over real bad. And NordVPN is absolutely the way to go if you want to have a VPN to use. I have used it myself for over two and a half years now, and I have had no problems with it. I have not seen a single time it was down. And with that being said, you can go to nordvpn.com slash azeal to get a discount today and start with up to a three-year plan. Anyways, continue. Yeah, so they shut down your internet. And this is bad, especially in quarantine, because you really have nothing else to do. You're like sitting in your apartment. And for those two weeks, I had to use a VPN. So if the VPN service I was using was down, I'm not going to say the name because you're not sponsored by them. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> so if the VPN service I was using was down, I basically had to sit there and do nothing. I like sat and stared at a wall. Oh, dude, I would want to die. Not only could I not do the work I do for a living, I would be so bored. <laughs> it was so bad. Like, like, I, like, Thankfully, I had a PlayStation with me. But half of the games I wanted to play required internet. Ooh. I'm sitting there going, well, what do I do now? So what I did was I brushed up on my Chinese. I'm not as fluent as I'd like to be, and I don't speak it very well. Like, I can introduce myself, and I can order food, and that's about the limit. Thankfully, you were an English teacher and not a Chinese teacher. Yes. <laughs> that was the probably the best part of being there, if I'm going to be honest, was teaching those kids. Wildly different than teaching here. Do you want to talk about, like, the vibe that you got from the education system there because from what you told me in our little conversations before the dynamic that you have between student and teacher is vastly different oh yeah so do you want me to talk about the the difference between the schools in china versus the schools in america or uh the differences in like the te teaching standards yeah start with the like the difference in just the vibe so a school in china is uber competitive so from first through eight that is all paid for by the government high school and beyond you have to not only pass an entrance exam but you have to pay a tuition fee Oof. and i might be wrong it might be ninth as well that's also free but i'm going based on what my coworkers have told me which is that high school isn't free and my experience high school is 9 through 12. it might be different huh 
like all high schools are basically private schools, but government owned. Pretty much, yeah. You have to pay tuition for high school. You have to pass an entrance exam to get into said high school. And after that, you have to maintain a certain level of academic excellence. Imagine your market value as a human being assessed when you're like 14, dude. That's wild. Pretty much. And when I say it's uber competitive, I mean like when they take their finals, all the scores are posted in the middle of the school for everyone to see. Like everyone knows how well you did. It all leads back to this concept of, and this is a cultural thing, not so much a government thing. It all leads back to this concept of face. You don't want to lose face. So the better you do, the more face you retain. It's hard on the teachers, too, because especially if you're not from China, it's all hard on the teachers. If you grow up in a culture where you're taught that failure isn't a bad thing, it's just a learning experience, it's jarring to come over there to find out that everyone thinks the exact opposite. Like, I taught in a uh, facility that was run by the company that hired me as well, but I had to go to a public school for every now and then to teach. It was extra money. So most of the time I spent was in a extra facility. Think of it as like cram school, almost. But you had, like, kindergartners coming to it. Oh, no. So the levels were K through 12. I'm not going to say the name of the company. It was K through 12. And we divided them up into groups based on their academic ability. That's awful. Or their English speaking ability, I should say. Well, the reason we did that is because some of the kids coming in knew a little bit of English and therefore would be bored in the beginner level classes. So it's not evaluation. It's just a functional thing. Yes, we did that specifically because we didn't want them to be bored and act out because they're bored. So the levels we had from K to third grade, I want to say, like I said, it's been a minute. So my brain is kind of still stuck on American schools. It was either K through third. I'll just go with that because it's easier. K through third, we had the English teaching system of Big Fun. That was the legit name. It was Big Fun <laughs> 1, Big Fun 2, and Big Fun 3. What? And they're, they were good books because what they did is they broke down a lot of the hardest parts of English into units that were easily digestible for kids. Though the only thing that I personally disagreed with with the big fun books was that there were reading segments. And if you've ever seen like kindergarten kids trying to read, it's really hard for even native English speakers to learn how to read, let alone people who are it's their second language. Dude, my mom, her job is literally to teach kids that are having trouble reading in second grade how to read. It doesn't come naturally to everyone. It, dude, yeah, that's not good for the kids that need the most help. Like I said, it's hard enough for native speakers to learn how to read, let alone second language. Yeah. But the surprising thing was, is that I was once told by my manager, the goal isn't to get them to read so much as it is for them to say the words and recognize them. And he said that simply because he said, because you're not going to get them to read in kindergarten as a second language. He told me that for my sanity's sake. Yeah, no, that's kind of an unachievable goal. He was a really good uh, leader, my manager. He was a good guy. I'm just sad they fired him because he asked for more money. Oh, come on. Yeah, it was a shitty situation. I felt bad for him because he was doing the work of three people and getting paid for one. Ugh. So at most of these facilities, the manager is required to teach half of the hours as an actual teacher because he's spending most of his time evaluating and doing other things. This company was so badly managed that he was doing full teaching hours with us on top of his managerial duties and attending meetings to discuss educational excellence. Dude. And he was expected to get 80 hours of teaching in a month. It was a weird situation. Like, so, like I said, so you had Big Fun 1, Big Fun 2, Big Fun 3, and that was for our K through 3 students. And that was introducing concepts like, what is this? It's a cat. What is this? It's a dog. Stuff like that. Easy stuff for Big Fun 1. Big Fun 2, you got more into your identifications of A and Ann, almost. You didn't really go in depth with them beyond A and and Apple and Orange and stuff like that. Big Fun 3, honestly, I feel like we could have axed just because it's really hard, like looking at it, because it's stuff like there was a whole unit dedicated to ordering at a restaurant. Oh boy. Like you had to ask, what's on the menu? And I'm, I'm looking at this going, I don't think a first or second grader is going to understand this. Yeah. Like, what's on a menu and i'm sitting there going oh no because some of the choices were what i'd like for dinner is blah blah and i'm sitting there going this is bad like this isn't even like this should be saved for like a later unit this shouldn't even be in like in this segment of the book so like the skill curve was like uh 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 yeah it literally went like this and then shot all the way to the roof 
And then you get to the next group of books, which is Big English 1. So we have Big Fun, then Big English. For Big English, we had Big English 1 through 6, essentially. We never taught any Big English 6 groups. Most people usually graduated before we got to Big English 5. So we, we never had a Big English 6 group. So Big English 1, the first unit, I remember this because I had to teach it like six different times. I had like eight classes, most of which were like Big English 1, Big English 2, and then I had my big fun classes. So unit 1 is literally school stuff, school supplies. What is this? It's a pencil. So we're back to the it's a for Big English 1. So you had to teach them the difference between it, it is, and they are. Ah, I see. Things that come naturally to an English speaker because we just, you don't even think about that. Yeah, but in Chinese, they don't have plurals. It's dependent on your context if you're using they or it. Oh. Like, they don't even have gendered uh, pronouns. Based? Sorry, continue. Like, they don't have gendered pronouns in Chinese, which was another thing we had to teach them was the differentiation of pronouns because that doesn't exist in the Chinese language. For example, he is and she is is pronounced tashi. It's pronounced the exact same way. Oh, I see. So everybody's non-binary in Chinese language. Kind of, kind of not. Like, it's dependent on your context. Like, if you're talking about someone's daughter and you're talking to the mother, if she's very good at it, you should go, you would go, Tashi hao in you. And that might be wrong, but... Don't even try to subtitle that. Yeah, I might be wrong, but I... Tashi hao in you. She is very good at English. Oh. She has very good English. You could also go, Ta de... Tada in you how there we go. Her English is good. Like I said, my Chinese is very rusty. Yeah. So like the very fundamental building blocks of our language just aren't the same because it's not a language that's based on the Latin alphabet. Yes, it is very much based off phonetics and context. Everything is down to context. Like every character in the Chinese language has four tones and each tone makes the word changes the definition of the word to something else. Oh, wow. But the crazy thing is, it's written the exact same. Oh, you gotta do a little puzzle solving just to speak and read. Speaking's easy. Reading is hard. <laughs> oh. Because with reading, like I said, so ma, ma. So when you're saying mother, you have to go ma, ma. So you have to change the tone. Because if you say it just straight, you're just saying horse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 no. So there's four tones. You have ma, where you keep it level. Ma, where you raise the last syllable, ma, where you have like this little annotation thing where it goes down, then back up, and then ma, where it goes sharply down. That last one is used for scolding. That's what I heard it used for, which is hysterical. One of our coworkers had to bring your kid to work every day to pick him up after school and bring them to work. Every time she'd scold him, you just hear go ma at the end of the sentence. And I'm just sitting there going, <laughs> it was great. She was a really sweet lady. I miss a lot of my Chinese coworkers. They were good people. Yeah, that's something we really got to clarify as a culture here in America is how none of the Chinese people individually that are not part of this power system want what they have there. They just are in a system of power that decides for them how their life is. And the crazy thing is the reason they're content with it is all due to national pride. Everything boils down to pride. Like, I knew a coworker who still holds a grudge against the Japanese. Wow. Yeah. Like I said, it all comes down to, to nationalist pride. Like, they refuse to let go of their grudge. There are Japanese restaurants run by Chinese people. Like, you cannot own a restaurant unless you have someone from China running the restaurant. Wow. Or, like, maintaining the business. It was weird. And I bring this up because there was a bar called Wade's Bar and Grill that was owned and operated by a Chinese citizen. But the guy who did the day to day was from America. It's such a weird political alignment for a country to have because things like nationalism and fear of the outsider are very right wing ideas. But then you have this like very powerful healthcare system and that is yeah it's like it's this weird blend it's a blend of keep the people content so they don't revolt that's yeah. what i've boiled it down to it's more authoritarian than left or right it's very authoritarian the reason they've given a lot of the chinese people the things that they have like the universal health care the fact that everyone gets paid a living wage the fact that most rents only do after you've received two paychecks is all to keep people content and proud of their country. So that way they don't run into issues like, well, what they're facing now. That the system was working up until COVID. COVID is when the gears kind of got jammed up. 
because I don't know if you know this, but a lot of Chinese money, their economy, a lot of it's based in real estate. So when COVID hit, the market kind of, it was like a bubble and it burst bad in a bad way. I get videos on my recommended about how screwed China is right now. And I'm like, I don't know enough to talk on this, but all I know is even though I hate it here in America, it's probably better than that. Yeah, no country's people deserves to go through what they're going through right now. Like all of the money in China was tied up in real estate for a lot of people. So when that bubble burst, a lot of people lost a lot of money, which is crazy because everyone's like, well, how do people have money in China when it's communist? It's this weird hybrid fusion of communist regime with capitalistic ideals. Yeah, I think I've heard it called state capitalism before, where the state decides if you're allowed to be capitalist. Yes, that's pretty much what it boils down to. And they did that specifically to keep themselves from following the USSR's fate in the 80s because they saw the USSR was dying because it stuck rigidly to its ideals. They knew something had to change. Because obviously Mao's famines didn't do the trick for them somehow. Yes, it's, it's so weird that that didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> but most of what I'm talking about is like city life. It's even worse out in like the rural areas where there's not a lot of money going around to begin with. It's set up in such a way that most of the money is congregated in cities. So if you live out in like farmland, you have nothing. Oh, it's awful, really. And when I say cities, I mean like the big cities. Like Hangzhou was a big city. Shanghai is a big city. Beijing's a big city. Like the main big cities of China, that's where all the money's congregated. Smaller cities are usually a little more run down. And the healthcare isn't quite as good as what you'd find in a big city. Yeah. You were talking about the censorship and the surveillance earlier. Are those things as effectively upheld in smaller cities or do they kind of fall away as you get into the smaller areas? The smaller cities definitely had a lot of surveillance, but I noticed that a lot of the tech was more outdated. Like you'd see like CCTV cameras. Like the old stuff. Yeah, it was very strange. Like, so when I arrived in Hangzhou, I was originally to work in a city called Donyan, and I stayed there for two weeks before I had to come back to Hangzhou. Donyan is a, definitely a smaller city than Hangzhou. It doesn't have as many people. It's definitely a lot more rural, and it shows. Like, the tech's a little outdated. They have some of the nicer stuff the city has, like the rent-a-bikes. What's big in China is not pollution, which is weird, given the air pollution but a big thing in china is like renting bikes and renting vehicles like renting like e-bikes you can rent an e-bike which was nice all their buses run off electric by the way which was really cool emissionless buses like i'd never seen that before it was kind of cool definitely like the tech level of china is very much higher than the united states and i think they've realized that their pollution level is bad which is why all these initiatives were introduced in the first place but yeah, so going back to Don Yang and talking about like the differences in like security and stuff like that. So they had like CCTV cameras and the buildings were definitely not as well taken care of. And the streets weren't as well taken care of. Like it's wildly different between big city to small city. And then I never got to visit the rural areas as much as I would have liked to. But from the few times I did, it was definitely not the place you want to be. Like you're not there by choice. It's kind of sad. Most of my time was spent in the big cities like Hangzhou, which, fun fact, was a 30-minute train ride from Wuhan. Oof, pretty close to ground zero. We were like the second city to get quarantined. <laughs> Oof. And were you told to, like, hush up about it when it happened? Like, could you not talk about it to people? What we were told was it was a pneumonia outbreak. It wasn't given a big COVID label until mid-February. So we were allowed to tell people that we were on quarantine due to a pneumonia outbreak because we had our final New Year's party. For Chinese New Year. And then my manager, who I told you about earlier, he was like, hey, mate, we're probably going to be put on lockdown for a while. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, a lot of cities are shutting down. He said, we're probably next. He said, just expect a text from corporate in the next few months that we're going to be going on quarantine. So a week later, I get a text from, from corporate going, Hangzhou is now on quarantine. No one is allowed to leave. Just keep posting homework assignments to the kids. There's nothing we can do right now. We'll figure out what we're going to do as the time goes on, which is crazy to me that he knew. But it was getting obvious. You could tell that stuff was going on because we were hearing every day how like cities were starting to shut down, that there was something going wrong with Wuhan. Wuhan was completely cut off at this point. And I'm not talking like slightly cut off. I'm talking full military enforced quarantine. Like they, they had like 
tanks lining up the border. So no one could get in or out, even if you wanted to get out, or even if you were there and you wanted to leave, you had to get special permission and the embassy had to extract you from Wuhan. Even when I was there, like I was there from August to November 30th of 2020. So when I was there, I contemplated contacting the embassy before quarantine had run out to come home. I never did though. What made you want to stay? Honestly, it was just, I wanted to finish out my contract because if I had canceled my contract, I wasn't going to get my reimbursement for my flight back. Oh, yeah. That's $800 that I was never going to get back. So it was more or less greed. Fair. Which is ironic considering where I was. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you made it back in one piece. True. It was a crazy, crazy time to be there. It really was. Like, And what's even crazier, it was the first time I'd ever left the country. Oh, wow. It's like, hmm, most people, their first time leaving the country, they go to, like, Europe or Australia or places like that. Me, I'm like, no, I want to go right to a dictatorship. (laughs) And I want to stay there on a contract. I want to stay there on a contract in the middle of a pandemic where everybody has no rights. That's the life for me. Oh, we love that. We love that. It was was so... (laughs) Living there was unreal. And, like, I had a bunch of warning signs. Like, the day I was supposed to leave, my flight got canceled twice. I had to fly out of Dallas. I got sick on the flight. Like, it was bad. The hospital gave me a false positive for hep C, which is why I had to come back to Hangzhou so they could retest me. Thankfully, it came up negative. But after all this, like most people are like, man, this ain't working out. Time to come home. I'm like, nah, I'm fine. It's all fine. It's all fine. The whole universe is screaming. Don't do this. Me, I got this. And you did. You did got this. The quarantine was definitely one of the hardest points in my life because I'm out there, no family. I still spoke to my mother every day or tried to, but I was there with no family by myself and I'm sitting there going, well, what am I going to do? I had never been so stressed out in my life. It was one of the most stressful, like, few months in my life. The time flew by. That's the crazy part. Like, we went on quarantine in January. We came out of quarantine in May, but those months in between felt like nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. Like, I would wake up, I lost track of time. I'd wake up and I'd look at my phone like, it's March already? Oh, yeah, I feel that. And I mean, and it was bad. Like, you had, like I said, police patrolling everywhere. Everywhere. Like, every corner you'd look, there'd be a police officer. At the gates into my apartment, you'd have the gate security, and then you'd have police officers. Uh. double checking everybody before they did their qr code thing if you were out with your pass you would get stopped randomly and searched jesus they did everything they could to ensure that this quarantine was enforced but they did it in like the most authoritarian way possible like you did not have a choice you had to comply yeah well how does it feel to be back home now honestly it's not too bad i definitely have some wanderlust though Mm. no going back to china though that's Yeah, we'll call it there. I think you've had enough of that place. Honestly, I wouldn't mind visiting Japan or Korea, but Korea's notorious for not paying their teachers very well. Yeah, my my friend who worked as a teacher in Korea from the U.S., he can agree. Yeah, the Hogwans aren't exactly known for their stellar treatment of their ESL teachers. And Japan, the cost of living is so high there that you need like eight jobs to even make ends meet. But I mean... For a first-time experience and my first time ever teaching, it was a pretty good experience, especially fresh out of college. Well, I'm glad that you got something positive out of it. Honestly, I got a lot of experience with, like, teaching kids ESL and teaching kids, like, I had a lot of good kids. I miss some of the kids I taught. Yeah, my girlfriend used to teach as a assistant in a classroom with kids around that age, and she always tells me, like, you know, the job sucked. The people I worked with sucked, but damn, those kids were adorable. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Chinese kids are super adorable. So their concept of showing affection to a teacher is wildly different than the ones than uh, showing affection to each America. Like if you like a teacher, you normally get them a gift or something. These kids would just burst in and hug you. Aww. You'd be sitting at your office and the kids would be coming in for class. Like I had a desk and I'd sit there and type out my lesson plans, write out what I'm doing for the day. And Right before my class would start, I'd always have like a student come in, look at me and go, they would say my name and then Lao Shi, which is teacher. And they'd run over and give me a big hug. Aw, that's adorable. They were really sweet, adorable kids. Yeah. And 
they're really good at listening to like so like i said i taught the kindergartners through the third graders and i also taught all the way up to seniors in high school so the higher in level you went the less chinese was allowed in the classroom which which is understandable but we had a shift in management and that went from use the chinese as necessary to no chinese in the classroom at all even for the kindergartners which was hard because the way we were doing things is there was an english speaking teacher and then a chinese speaking teacher and the chinese teacher would translate as needed for like certain games or activities and if i had a hard time explaining something i'd ask the Chinese teacher helped me demonstrate in their native language. And then most of the times the kids would get it and then they'd speak English and try it. Well, our new manager wasn't exactly fond of that idea. The way she viewed it was as a crutch. She'd get really upset whenever she heard it to the point where whenever we did reviews, if the Chinese teacher spoke English, it would be knocked off our uh, performance review. Bruh. She was like, there shouldn't be any Chinese in the classroom. It should be all be English. And we kept trying to tell her, like, they won't understand if we do it all in English. And it, that's not us saying that they're not smart enough to understand. That's just us saying they don't understand the concepts without the assistance. They learn a lot better if they hear examples of it and then try it for themselves. We were stressing that this was needed and she just wasn't getting it. She was our new manager. So the way it worked was you had manager for the English teachers, managers for the Chinese teachers. She was a manager for the Chinese teachers, but she was still a manager. If that makes sense. So we still had to kind of listen to her. She also made a mandatory thing for our jobs that we had to come in an hour before work and we had to present what games we were going to use to teach the kids that day. And then she would just rip through them with vocal criticism. Yeah, she was a pristine example of someone who doesn't know how things work and therefore will do everything in her power to make it miserable. So, for example, for like an example of like what her criticisms would be, I came up with a game to help teach phonics. So what I did was I went to the grocery store and I bought with my own money a set of Nerf guns with like the sticky bullets, like the suction cup ones. I handmade targets that had the fouls on them and I stick them to the board. And what the kids had to do is when I ever a teacher or one of their students made the vowel sound, the kid had to shoot the correct letter that it went with, which I thought was super engaging because now you got two sets of kids both using the vowel sound. So the kid has to say the vowel sound correctly and the other kid has to identify it. That was the end goal was to get every one of the students so familiar with the sounds that they could do it without thinking. I present in the end, she goes, how are the students supposed to know the difference between a, e, e, o, and u? And I'm sitting there going, well, you did it. We all did it. I'm not just throwing them in blindly. I'm clearly going to teach them. She wasn't too appreciative of that response. That's so lame. Dude, we need teachers that actually care about their students. Well, I am glad that you got home safe and that there was a positive experience to come of it. And I think it is perfectly reasonable to say that you've had just about enough of China now. <laughs> yeah, really, I did. <laughs> like I said, it was a crazy place to be in. Honestly, I don't regret going. Well, I'm glad to hear that, and thank you for telling me about the absolute insanity that you saw there. <laughs> no problem. Tell me a story, I want to hear it. You might think it's boring, but I'm interested. Tell me a story, I want to hear it. You might think it's boring, but I'm interested.